Before we begin if this is the first time you visit to our channel, you consider to subscribe. Trust Dr. Channel Dr. A B D E L W A H E D E Z Z E L A R A B. Thyrotoxicosis means an excess of thyroid hormone in the body. Having this condition also means that you have a low level of thyroid stimulating hormone TSH, in your bloodstream, because the pituitary gland senses that you have enough thyroid hormone. Who gets thyrotoxicosis? Thyrotoxicosis occurs in approximately 2% of women and 0.2% of men. W1 thyrotoxicosis due to Graves' disease most commonly develops between the second and fourth decades of life, whereas the prevalence of toxic nodular goiter increases with age. Autoimmune forms of thyrotoxicosis are more prevalent among smokers. W2 W3 toxic nodular goiter is most common in regions where dietary iodine is insufficient. How do patients with thyrotoxicosis present? Symptoms of overt thyrotoxicosis include heat intolerance, palpitations, anxiety, fatigue, weight loss, muscle weakness, and, in women, irregular menses. Clinical findings may include tremor, tachycardia, lid lag, and warm moist skin. Point one symptoms and signs of subclinical hypothyroidism, if present, are usually vague and nonspecific. What causes thyrotoxicosis? M. Causes of thyrotoxicosis Graves' disease Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder in which thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin TSI, binds to and stimulates the thyroid-stimulating hormone TSH, receptor on the thyroid cell membrane, resulting in excessive synthesis and secretion of thyroid hormone. Point two patients with Graves' disease usually have diffuse, non-tender, symmetrical enlargement of the thyroid gland. Ophthalmopathy, consisting of protrusion of the eyes with periorbital soft tissue swelling and inflammation, and inflammatory changes in the extraocular muscles resulting in diplopia and muscle imbalance, is clinically evident in 30% of patients with Graves' disease. Point 1. Toxic nodular goiter. Toxic adenomas are benign monoclonal thyroid tumors that secrete excess thyroid hormone autonomously. Thyrotoxicosis may develop in patients with a single autonomous thyroid nodule or in those with multiple autonomous nodules toxic multinodular goiter, also known as plumber's disease. Nodular autonomy typically progresses gradually, leading first to subclinical, and then to overt, hypothyroidism, W4 remission is rare. Physical examination shows a single thyroid nodule, usually at least 2.5 cm in size W5 or a multinodular goiter. Ophthalmopathy and other stigmata of Graves' disease, including antithyroid antibodies, are absent. Summary points. Classic symptoms of thyrotoxicosis include heat intolerance, palpitations, anxiety, fatigue, weight loss, irregular menses in women, and tremor. Serum values of thyroid-stimulating hormone TSH, are decreased in both overt and subclinical thyrotoxicosis, but serum values of peripheral thyroid hormone are increased only in overt disease. Thyrotoxicosis can have many causes, determining the cause is essential to formulate a treatment plan. A radioactive iodine uptake and scan should be performed when the cause of a patient's thyrotoxicosis cannot be definitively determined by history and physical examination. Treatment options for forms of overt hypothyroidism with normal to elevated radioactive iodine uptake include antithyroid drugs, radioactive iodine therapy, and thyroidectomy. Treatment options for thyroiditis, low radioactive iodine uptake, induced thyrotoxicosis include beta blockers to relieve symptoms and glucocorticoids to relieve anterior neck pain, if present. Whether or not to treat subclinical thyrotoxicosis remains controversial. Thyroiditis. Thyroiditis may cause transient thyrotoxicosis, with a characteristic low or undetectable thyroid radioiodine uptake. Point 3 Painless lymphocytic thyroiditis occurs in up to 10% of women after giving birth. Point 4 This is an inflammatory autoimmune disorder in which lymphocytic infiltration results in thyroid destruction and leads to transient mild thyrotoxicosis as thyroid hormone stores are released from the damaged thyroid. As the gland becomes depleted of thyroid hormone, progression to hypothyroidism occurs. Thyroid function returns to normal within 12 to 18 months in 80% of patients. 
Painful subacute thyroiditis, the most common cause of thyroid pain, is a self-limiting inflammatory disorder of possible viral etiology. Patients typically present acutely with fever and severe neck pain or swelling, or both. About half will describe symptoms of thyrotoxicosis. After several weeks of thyrotoxicosis, most patients will develop hypothyroidism, similar to postpartum thyroiditis. Thyroid function eventually returns to normal in almost all patients. The hallmark of the laboratory evaluation of painful subacute thyroiditis is a markedly elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein. Exogenous ingestion of thyroid hormone. Excess exogenous thyroid hormone is often associated with thyrotoxicosis. This may be iatrogenic, either intentional, when TSH suppressive doses of thyroid hormone are prescribed to suppress the growth of thyroid cancer or decrease the size, or unintentional, when overly vigorous treatment with thyroid hormone is prescribed for hypothyroidism. Thyrotoxicosis factitia may also result from patients' surreptitious use of thyroid hormones or from inadvertent ingestion. Serum thyroglobulin values are low to undetectable in thyrotoxicosis factitia but are raised in all other causes of thyrotoxicosis, W6. How is thyrotoxicosis diagnosed? In all forms of overt thyrotoxicosis, the serum value of TSH is decreased and the measurements of free thyroxine, T4, or free thyroxine index or free triiodothyronine, T3, or both, are raised. Subclinical thyrotoxicosis is defined as the presence of a persistently low serum concentration of TSH, with normal free T3 and T4 concentrations. Once thyrotoxicosis has been identified by laboratory values, the thyroid radioiodine uptake and scan may be used to help distinguish the underlying etiology figure. Thyroid radioiodine uptake is raised in Graves' disease. It may be normal or raised in patients with a toxic multinodular goiter. It is very low or undetectable in thyrotoxicosis resulting from exogenous administration of thyroid hormone or from the thyrotoxic phase of thyroiditis. A scan may be helpful in differentiating between Graves' disease diffuse uptake and toxic multinodular goiter focal areas of increased uptake, W7 the presence of raised serum concentrations of thyroperoxidase TPO, antibodies indicates an autoimmune thyroid disorder and a raised TSI value indicates Graves' disease. Figure 1. Evaluation of a low serum value of thyroid stimulating hormone. How should overt thyrotoxicosis be treated? Much of the treatment for thyrotoxicosis is based on empirical evidence, to date relatively few, large-scale, randomized clinical trials have been conducted. Perhaps for this reason, treatment preferences vary substantially by region. Antithyroid drugs. The theonamide drugs propylthiouracil PTU, and methimazole are available in the United States Box 1, Patient Story. Carbimazole, which is available in Europe and Asia, is similar to methimazole, to which it is metabolized. Point two: The theonamides all decrease thyroid hormone synthesis and will control hyperthyroidism within several weeks in 90% of patients. Point five: The theonamides may also decrease serum TSI concentrations in patients with Graves' disease. Point six: In addition, large doses of PTU, but not methimazole or carbimazole, decrease the peripheral conversion of T4 to the active hormone T3. 3.5 A small, randomized clinical trial has determined that a major advantage of methimazole over PTU is the fact that it may be given once daily, whereas PTU requires multiple daily doses. 7. Theonamides are used in patients with Graves' disease in the hope of inducing a remission. On the basis of the results of four randomized clinical trials variously comparing treatment durations of 6, 12, 18, 24, and 42 months, it has been determined that treatment with a theonamide for 12 to 18 months is optimal, resulting in long-term remission in 40 to 60 percent of patients with Graves' disease. Point eight aggregate data from several small clinical trials show no clear benefit from using a block replace regimen, a large dose of a theonamide in combination with thyroid hormone. Point 8 because toxic nodular goiter rarely, if ever, goes into remission, theonamides may be used for the short-term treatment of patients with toxic nodular goiter, to induce euthyroidism before definitive treatment, but are not appropriate for long-term therapy. 
Theonamides are never appropriate for the treatment of patients with thyroiditis, in whom no excess synthesis of thyroid hormone occurs. Box 1, Patient Story. I am a 65-year-old African-American woman. In June 2005, I visited my primary care doctor, primarily because of swelling in my feet. I also felt very tired, had lost weight, and my hands were shaking. The doctor examined me and ordered several blood tests, including a thyroid test. Based on the results, she ordered a thyroid uptake and scan and referred me to an endocrinologist. When I met the endocrinologist, my symptoms had worsened. I was extremely exhausted. It was difficult to walk or stand, and I was barely able to function. After examining me and reviewing the uptake and scan, my endocrinologist informed me that I had Graves' disease. She assured me that the disease is treatable, and prescribed methimazole and atenolol. That assurance, combined with the medicines she prescribed, helped me to feel better almost immediately. I continue to take the medicines as prescribed, I also meditate or relax daily. My endocrinologist closely monitors my progress, she has reduced the methimazole and discontinued the atenolol. I feel great. She tells me that my thyroid is almost normal, and she will continue to monitor my progress for at least a year. Roberta Owens-Jones. Minor side effects, such as fever, rash, urticaria, and arthralgias, occur in up to 5% of patients taking theonamides. More severe side effects are relatively rare. The side effects of methimazole and carbimazole, but not PTU, may be dose-related. Point five a granulocytosis occurs in approximately 0.5% of patients treated with theonamides. Point nine mild rises in transaminase concentrations occur in up to 30% of patients taking PTU, W8, but severe hepatotoxicity has been reported only rarely. W9 patients taking methimazole or carbimazole may develop reversible cholestasis or, much more rarely, acute Acute inflammatory hepatitis. Point one oh finally, vasculitis positive for antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies has been reported as a rare complication of PTU use. Point one one. Untreated hypothyroidism during pregnancy increases the risk for fetal and maternal complications. Theonamides cross the placenta in small amounts and may cause fetal hypothyroidism and goiter. Point one two limited evidence therefore shows that treatment with relatively low theonamide doses, just enough to keep the mother's free T4 index in the high normal to slightly thyrotoxic range, is advisable. Point one three methimazole has been associated with cutis aplasia and with other congenital anomalies, such as esophageal and choanal atresia. In rare case reports, point one four for this reason, PTU is preferred over methimazole or carbimazole during pregnancy in regions where it is available. Point 5 Although small amounts of theonamide medications are secreted in breast milk, prospective clinical studies have shown that the use of up to 750 mg per day of PTU or up to 20 mg per day of methimazole in lactating mothers does not affect infant's thyroid function. Point 5 16. Other drugs in patients with severe hypothyroidism or those with thyroiditis, in whom theonamides are inappropriate, adjunctive drugs may be used to alleviate symptoms or restore euthyroidism more rapidly. None of these therapies treat the underlying causes of thyrotoxicosis, beta blockers relieve symptoms such as tachycardia, tremor, and anxiety in thyrotoxic patients, beta blockade should be used as the primary treatment only in patients with thyrotoxicosis due to thyroiditis. High-dose glucocorticoids may be used to inhibit conversion of T4 to T3 in patients with thyroid storm, the most severe form of thyrotoxicosis. Glucocorticoids may also be used to relieve severe anterior neck pain and to restore euthyroidism in patients with painful subacute thyroiditis. Inorganic iodide SSKI or Lugol's solution, decreases the synthesis of thyroid hormone and release of hormone from the thyroid in the short term. It is used to treat patients with thyroid storm or, more commonly, to reduce thyroid vascularity before thyroidectomy. Iopanoic acid, an oral cholecystographic agent rich in iodine, decreases synthesis and release of thyroid hormone and inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3. Short-term use of iopanoic acid is effective for the treatment of thyroid storm or for rapid preparation for thyroidectomy, but it is ineffective as long-term therapy, W10. Radioactive iodine. 
Treatment with 131i is effective for patients with hypothyroidism due to Graves' disease or toxic nodular goiter. Retrospective data show that 80 to 90% will become euthyroid within 8 weeks after a single 131i dose, whereas the remainder will require one or more additional doses. 17 in patients with toxic multinodular goiter, a prospective clinical study has determined that radioactive iodine therapy will reduce goiter size by 40%.18131i eventually causes permanent hypothyroidism in almost all patients. Possible side effects of 131i therapy include mild anterior neck pain caused by radiation thyroiditis or worsened thyrotoxicosis for several days, owing to the leakage of preformed thyroid hormones from the damaged thyroid gland. Pretreatment with athionamide may reduce the risk for worsened thyrotoxicosis after treatment with 131i. Retrospective studies have shown that the efficacy of treatment with 131i is decreased after PTU treatment W11, but both prospective and retrospective studies have shown that the efficacy of 131i is not diminished after treatment with methimazole or carbimazole as long as the drug is discontinued 3 to 5 days before 131i is administered W11, W12. Graves' ophthalmopathy may develop or worsen after treatment with 131i, especially in smokers and in patients with severe hypothyroidism. 19 Strong prospective evidence shows that the exacerbation of Graves' ophthalmopathy can be prevented by the simultaneous administration of glucocorticoids. 20. Radioactive iodine therapy is relatively contraindicated in children and adolescents because of the lack of data regarding the long term risks associated with radiation. Radioactive iodine is absolutely contraindicated during pregnancy and lactation. Thyroidectomy. A meta-analysis found that thyroidectomy cures hypothyroidism in more than 90% of cases. 21 In addition, it eliminates compressive symptoms from large toxic multinodular goiters. Unlike radioactive iodine treatment, it is not associated with worsening of Graves' ophthalmopathy. Thyroidectomy is safe in the second trimester of pregnancy. The procedure bears almost no risk of death when carried out by experienced surgeons. However, thyroidectomy is complicated by recurrent laryngeal nerve injury or permanent hypoparathyroidism in 1-2% of patients. 1. Transient hypercalcemia, bleeding, or infection are also potential complications. Surgery results in permanent hypothyroidism in most patients. Theonamides are used to restore euthyroidism before thyroidectomy to avoid more severe thyrotoxicosis from leakage of thyroid hormone into the circulation at the time of surgery and to reduce operative and postoperative complications associated with anesthesia and surgery in thyrotoxic patients. SSKI or Lugol's solution is given for 7 to 10 days before surgery for Graves' disease to decrease thyroid vascularity. Should subclinical thyrotoxicosis be treated? If serum TSH values are low because of overzealous treatment of hypothyroidism in non-thyroid cancer patients, the dose of L-thyroxine should be lowered. The question of whether endogenous subclinical hypothyroidism should be treated remains controversial, but current guidelines based on available evidence recommend considering treatment when serum TSH values are persistently less than 0.1 mu, L.22, 23 treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism may decrease the risk of atrial fibrillation and may decrease the risk of low bone density in postmenopausal women. 24, 25 once the decision has been made to treat subclinical hypothyroidism, the goal of therapy is to normalize serum TSH values, preferably by using small doses of theonamides or, less advisably, definitive therapy with 131i.